we were talking about being mature in the Lord. And being mature in Christ should never mean not being mindful of people around us. Does that make sense? The more that we mature in the Lord, in fact, the more aware of our surroundings and the people that surround us, we should be. That means we should be always attentive to the people, the souls around us, the, the people that are dealing with things, the people that are suffering, the people that are, are going through something. Amen? And if you stop to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and as you continue to grow in the Lord, you'll notice, church, that the Holy Spirit is ready and the Holy Spirit is willing. Amen? The Bible says the flesh is, the flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing. We ourselves are the ones that are the ones that don't ever want to kind of stop what we're doing to pay attention to the agenda of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's agenda is number one. Amen. The Holy Spirit's agenda in our life as believers should be the top priority in everything that we do. So like I said, we mature in Jesus. It should never mean that we stop being mindful of those who are lost. There's a lot of people in this room tonight that I could venture to say that the more you've matured in Jesus, one of two things will happen. You will, A, become more Christ-like, and that means that you'll be more sensitive to the Spirit, or B, you will become more religious. There's basically no in-between. You'll A, become more Christ-like and you will walk in step with the Holy Spirit or B, you will become more religious. The religious were those that were comfortable being in the temple. They were those that were comfortable being the lawmakers, so to speak. They were those that were comfortable dressing up and getting ready for church and looking the part. But the Bible says they were like whitewashed tombs. That they worshiped God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. And Jesus, as he grew, the Bible says, the book of Luke, that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. He grew in favor with the Lord. So Jesus in his upbringing, you know, we, we don't know a lot about Jesus' life before he was 30 years old. But we know some things, right? We know how he was born. We know where he was born. We know, you know, some of the towns. We know that his parents lost him. You know, we, we've learned some things about the life of Jesus. But Jesus, by the time he gets to the age of 30 and he begins his public ministry and Jesus begins to, to come under the anointing and the power of God, we see that Jesus' maturity in the Lord, in his relationship with his father, it drew him to people. It didn't draw him away from them. Amen. Amen. He was living in such a way where he began to get closer to people, despite the fact that a lot of people weren't crazy about him. They thought he was, you know, a heretic. They thought he was a person that was making false claims about his life. They thought Jesus was, you know, uh, the kind of person that was, was, you know, just, you know, they, they said that he would get his power from Beelzebub, they were saying that Jesus was getting his power from the demonic realm and not from the Father in heaven. And these people that were the ones that were questioning Jesus the most were the ones found in religion. They were the ones so stooped in religion, like I said, they were knew the law. How many of you know the word of God? Amen. I know I've been teaching you for a while and Pastor's been teaching you for much, much longer than I, and a lot of people have poured into your life. We should not be biblically illiterate. Amen. But we should know the Lord of whom we speak of. We should know the Lord of whom we have relationship with. And if we have relationship with the Lord, we will realize that religion is the greatest thing that wars against the spirit of God moving. I can prove it to you in scripture. I don't have the scripture off the top of my head. 
But there's a verse when Jesus was young, and the Bible says that he was in the temple, he was in the synagogue, and everybody was listening, and Jesus got up and he began to speak. And he began to share from the word, and, and as he was sharing the word, Everything changed in the atmosphere. Everything changed in that temple. People, the Bible says, were in awe. They were awestruck of the knowledge of the, they were impressed in a way with how Jesus spoke about the Lord. But then somebody spoke up and said these words. But isn't he the son of Mary and Joseph? Isn't he just that carpenter kid. And isn't it interesting, church, that the devil always wants to diminish or decrease or negate, if you will, who you are becoming in Christ. Oh, they're just that, yeah, it's just that guy. It's just that woman. They're just these religious people. And all along, the Holy Spirit is working through and in your life. And it was interesting that on that day that when Jesus was basically just diminished and said, oh, he's just a carpenter. He's just the son of Mary and Joseph. It caused people to pull away from the Holy Spirit. Why am I saying all this? Because, like I said, you will either A, become more mature in Jesus and walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, speak like Jesus, treat people like Jesus, or you will become more religious. I don't know about you, but I want to be like the Lord. Amen. I want to live like Jesus. So if we're not wise in our living in this world, then church, we can do more damage than good for the kingdom of Christ. So last week, this verse I told the guys to pull up, sorry, 2 Timothy 2 and 23 says this. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must, must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. It said those who opposed him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So this was the main point that we were talking about last week, that we must gently instruct those who oppose God. We must gently instruct those who are it ends with believing in Jesus. Because you'll meet people a lot of times, and some people can be cordial of your faith, respectful of your faith, but when there's the clear line that's drawn, you'll see people act a certain way and say, you know what, I don't believe all that stuff and this and that. And they may literally oppose what it is that you believe and what it is that you've built your life upon which is upon the word of God, upon the Lord. And in those moments where you have the opportunity to respond to the opposition, the Bible is giving us clear instruction that we're supposed to gently instruct them in the hopes that God will lead them to repentance. Now, this is an important thing because like I said, in this day and age, a lot of people don't gently instruct. They take the Bible and they just, you know, the Bible is a sword, but... Sometimes they use it to cut off more ears than they do to use it to, to draw a dividing line where people know what truth is. Jesus has probably had to put back a lot of ears when we've drawn the sword the wrong way. Amen. And so our response to people is important. The way that we speak to people about the Lord in hopes that they'll be led to repentance is important, church. Proverbs 15 and 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 
a harsh word will stir up anger. And so we need to be people that God uses to turn people towards him, amen, and not be those people that turn people from him. And so this is what wise living looks like, amen? This is where we have a chance to respond, but we respond in wisdom. We have a chance to respond a certain way, but we respond in the way that the Lord would want us to change. Because how many of you know, church, that God's expectations for us, they're unchanging, amen? He hasn't, he hasn't changed. God is not grading on a curve. God is not, you know, some, somehow saying, you know what? I'm just going to do things differently. It's interesting, or at least I find it interesting, that when I was in school, and, and I'm sure for you, uh, when you were in school, you know, they did things differently. Nowadays, I see my daughters, they go to school, and they go to a great school. But the truth is, is that they just do things differently. One of those things is like they have the kids grade each other's papers. To me, I'm like, why would you trust another 10-year-old to grade another 10-year-old's paper? Isn't that like, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. I'm going like, dude, if the kid in front of me or the kid behind me or the kid that my paper's in their possession, if they don't like me, they may not, you know, mark them all right or mark them all wrong or whatever. And I find that interesting. It's like, I don't think they should be doing that. You know, I don't think that's a very trustworthy thing. But when I was in school, the teacher graded the paper. It was that way always. And in the times that we're living in, things are changing. Because so many things change in our society, we believe and we kind of just expect God to adapt to us. But the Bible says that he is unchanging, amen? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are the ones, the Bible says, that our life is supposed to conform to him, amen? So I know that the Lord desires growth. You know, he desires for our growth in this area because life is short, amen? And so when we're dealing with people that oppose truth, we need to do it in the gentleness of the Lord. Because I can tell you, church, if the Lord dealt with us, the same way that we've dealt with others at times, we would all be bitter, lost, and unchanged. If God dealt with me the way that I've dealt with people in this world, and guess what? I'll be the first one to admit my mistakes. If God dealt with me that way every single time, my friends, there would be no grace for me to stand here today. Because I would have shown myself to be a person that's too harsh when he should have been calm. A, a person that was, you know, too quick tempered to, to instead of be a person that loved. But the Lord isn't that way. And I'm thankful that the Lord gives us that loving instruction that we desperately need. Amen. And so we could thank the Lord that he didn't have to blow up and get angry at us for us to ever understand the points or the, or the wisdom in scripture that he wants us to know, amen? Matthew 11 and 29 teaches us, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He said, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, amen? In other words, when you apply what the Lord is teaching, gentleness and humility and consideration, all of these things, then you'll be at peace, Amen? You'll find yourself at peace because I guarantee nobody of us in this world wants to be in frustration. Amen? None of us want to be at ends with, with life. And so we must put into practice and learn how to handle things the right way that the Lord wants us to. I heard it said this way one time. It said, don't put people down unless it's on your prayer list. Amen? And we're living in a season right now, church, where there's a lot of backbiting going on. I mean, that's just the truth. If, if you go to work and somebody else gets a gold star and you don't, all of a sudden there's backbiting going on. If you play a sport and the other person got to play more than you, all of a sudden there's backbiting going on. If you vote for this person or vote for that person, you already know. And so listen, we're not to be those kind of people 
that are turning people from Jesus. The mission that we have in this world is to turn people towards him. So our next point is found in James 3.17, and that is this. Let's read that together. It says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, and submissive. That word submissive actually means the word reasonable. It means being willing to listen to reason and appeal and be willing to change when one is wrong and be ready to obey. This is what reason means. True wisdom, church, is not stubborn or hard, but it's reasonable and obedient. I'll say that one more time. True wisdom that the Lord gives us is not stubborn or hard, but it's reasonable and obedient. That means that a wise person, they listen to God. A wise person listens to the word of the Lord. A wise person ingests the word of God. And, and the wise person will even take into account what other people have to say. Have you ever heard that proverb that says there's wisdom in the counsel of many? Believe it or not, it's, it's good sometimes to... Now, let me preface that by saying you better be sitting amongst wise people. Amen. Because just because there's many people doesn't mean there's wisdom. Amen. You can be sitting in the bunch of middle of a bunch of fools and then they're all the sudden going to get some crazy idea. Just like they did when Moses went up the mountain. A bunch of fools sitting down at the bottom like, hey, you know what? Let's build a golden calf. That sounds like a great idea. That golden calf almost ended their life. <laughs> Fools. But there's wisdom in the counsel of many. There's wisdom amongst people. And listen, if you're a wise person and you sit amongst wise people, then guess what? You can draw something from their life, from their wisdom, the way they live their life, to apply it to your own. So a wise person listens to God and to others. There's obedience and there's a willing to reason and submit. So Proverbs 12 and 18 says this, the words of the reckless, they pierce like swords. Remember I told you a minute ago, sometimes we're using our sword to cut off more ears than we are to use the way that God's given it to us to handle. So it says the words of the reckless, they pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The tongue of the person that walks in wisdom brings healing. You see, church, it takes a small person to point out somebody's faults. But it takes an even bigger person to admit their own. Amen? It takes a real small individual to point out somebody's mistakes or faults in life. Truth is, is we could all do that. That's easy. But not too often do we want to stand in the mirror and admit our own mistakes, admit our own shortcomings, admit our own faults before the Lord. Proverbs 25 and 18 says this, like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is a person who gives false testimony against a neighbor. What does that mean? When you're speaking ill about somebody, you're, you're saying things that are wrong. You're saying things that aren't factual, they're not true. But because you're mad, because you're upset, because you're bitter, because whatever, you say those things in such a manner, and it says it's like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow. In other words, it's doing damage. It's hurting somebody. Whether that's their testimony or them emotionally. Because how many of you have ever had somebody say something bad about you? Raise your hand. Some of y'all have never had anybody say, I need to be friends with you. or You're friends. You must have amazing friends. See, when somebody says something bad about you, it can cut your heart. Amen? It can do damage. It could affect you emotionally. It could affect you mentally. It could affect you in various ways. And we have to be careful that when we are speaking of people that are God's creation, 
those that God has made, we have to be careful not to just sputter something out of our lips that's not true because it can do damage. And guess what? Again, what is the point? The point is that we are to be people that lead more people to him than be people that lead them from him. So in these two Proverbs that we read, it mentions two key words. The first proverb that we read, it mentioned the word reckless. Amen? And in the second proverb, we saw the word false. So that tells us that God-loving and God-fearing people were not to live in any kind of matter, matter rather that's reckless and false. You and I weren't created to live in this reckless, just, oh, we're just going to do things however we want manner. Or we're just going to live people that live a lie manner before God. Because the life of Jesus, he never exemplified these characteristics. Amen? Jesus wasn't reckless in anything that he did. He did some things that were pretty extravagant. Don't get me wrong. I mean, when he had the whole haul of fish, you know, you know, tearing nets and stuff, like that was a pretty extravagant thing. But it wasn't reckless. Recklessness is different. Recklessness is the guy going 100 miles an hour in a school zone. That's reckless. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get, you know, you know killed in, in a situation like that. Jesus never exemplified anything false about his life. In fact, he modeled the opposite. He modeled responsibility. He modeled care. He, re, he modeled prudence. And more than that, there wasn't a false claim about his life because he was who he claimed to be. Jesus was who he claimed to be. And when Jesus spoke of others, it was the exact same. Think about that. He only spoke the truth. Jesus only spoke truth. Why was that? Because he was submissive to his heavenly father. See, this is part of the reason. He was submissive and obedient in everything that he did. But the tongue of the wise like that proverb we read, brings healing. Everyone that Jesus encountered, many people were healed. Either because Jesus spoke to whatever it was that they were dealing with. He rebuked a demon out of their life. He spoke healing over their body. He spoke forgiveness over their soul. Whatever it was, they received healing healing from the Lord. If our words, the Bible says that we have life and death, right? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Some of you woke up today and was like, man, I got to go to work. Oh my gosh. Woe is me. And we forgot the privilege that it is to have a job. We forgot the privilege that it is to put food on the table and have food in the pantry, have clothes on our body. I talked to a guy before church this evening. I don't see him here tonight. I invited him. When I pulled up to church about 530, there was a young man sitting outside our, our church. I struck up a conversation with him for a few minutes. Long story short, he's trying to get back on his feet. Did jail time, lost his car, got kind of in a bad situation with some of his family, said, I have nobody. He's got a job at, I don't know, some fast food restaurant, and he's trying to get back on his feet. I sat there, and I talked to this guy for a few minutes, and you know, just told him, I'm like, hey, man, listen, there is hope in Jesus. I'm like, I, I realize right now you may feel abandoned by everybody in the world, but there's hope through Christ. And he was like, man, thank you. He's like, I needed to hear that. And he, you know, had to get an Uber to, to go home. And I told him, I was like, listen, if it costs you too much, you know, to get back here tonight, I'm just, don't worry about it. I said, but... You know, hopefully I'll see you again soon. But church, we can easily look at a person like that 
and draw words from the well of our soul and draw judgments upon an individual or we can speak life over an individual. The last thing I would want that guy to do is to in any way think, oh, you know, there's some religious pastor. He called me a priest at first. He thought I was a priest. Never been called a priest before. I don't think I look very priestly. That's just me. I, I need the little white thing. But the last thing I would ever want to be in this world is a person that is a person that does more damage than good. So the tongue of the wise brings healing. The one who could say something but pauses to listen to the Holy Spirit instead of their flesh is wise. In other words, how many of you have been in situations where you've had all kinds of things that you wanted to say? Amen? Ooh, man, you were like, ooh, this is juicy. I could say that right now. I could just drop this literal bomb on them, just boom, blows up. You win the argument, but guess what? Probably lost the soul. It's not worth it. Amen? In other words, you could have had reason to respond differently, but thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Who just gives us just enough pause to reconsider what it is that we want to say and how it is that we want to respond. Proverbs 24 and 13 says, Eat honey, my son, for it is good. It says, Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. It says, Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. It said, If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Amen? So walking in wisdom is sweet because we continually find our hope through Jesus. Amen? It's in finding his words, his response, and acting upon it in any given situation that will always keep you walking in step with the Holy Spirit. So true wisdom is reasonable. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, we find this verse, and it says this. The Lord speaking, he says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. He said, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Do we have the same one? No, we don't. I thought I saw it differently. It says, come now and let us settle the matter. Now, it's interesting, this word reason and this word settle. The definition of reason from this passage is this. It comes from this word yaka, which means this, to decide, to judge, and to prove. So this is not reason like we think. Like you and me, like we're going to make a deal, right? That's not that kind of reasoning. If I said, hey, you know what? Like, I'll preach every Wednesday if you come to church every Wednesday. That would be you and me trying to work something out. Amen? But that's not the reasoning that's being spoken of here. Like I said, it means to decide, to judge, and to prove. So how much more humbling church does it get That God himself pointing out our sins to us. Telling us that we are stained with blood. That we're unworthy. And with the very opportunity to bury us. He doesn't bury us in this moment. But he gives us a promise to those who would repent before him. It's interesting. Notice church, I didn't say reason. Before him. Because our English may take us down the wrong path here. And I need us to understand this point very clearly. There is no bargaining with the Lord. Amen. There's no bargaining with God. I heard a guy one time. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Or certainly one of them. Top ten probably. There was a guy that was asking people for money. And they would give him a, a sum of money. I don't know what it was, $5,000, $10,000. He would reserve for them a lot in heaven. I'm serious. Just like you giving me some money and, and I'll say, okay, there's a piece of land for you. I'll reserve it under your name. 
Well, my wife and I built our house some years ago, six years ago or whenever it was, we gave a certain amount of money down and then they reserved that lot for us. So nobody could buy that lot out from under us. We were able to pick the piece of land where we wanted to build our home. And this guy was selling lots in heaven. He said, oh, you give me $10,000. I'm a prophet. I'm a man of God. I'm a pastor. And guess what? I'll reserve a lot for you in heaven. Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard of? See, there's no bargaining with God. That guy could have never made that deal. That guy could have never fulfilled that promise. In fact, all he did was he just stole a bunch of people's money. But like I mentioned to you at the beginning of this message, those who are biblically illiterate would take the bait of such a foolish bargaining agreement. Such a foolish thing. There's no bargaining with the Lord when it comes to our spiritual condition. Amen? God decides and God judges and God proves every man to be a sinner. So that means for you and I, when we admit that we're at fault and we drop the defensive attitude and we accept who we are and we allow the Lord to come into our heart. And the Bible says that, just like Paul said, and I believe the book of Galatians, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. He said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is the acceptance, and this is the beginning of transformation that comes through being saved by Jesus. Accepting his perfect sacrifice and the work that he did on the cross for our sins This and only this is where it comes in to play. But no man has the right to bargain with the Lord. And only through the Lord can the next part happen. Isaiah 44 and verse 22 says, The Lord speaking, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud and your sins like the morning mist. He said, return to me. He said, for I have redeemed you. And so if the God of the heavens and the earth would extend mercy and grace in such a way to you and I, a fallen people, a fallen creation, then I ask a simple question tonight. Why can't we offer the same to others? Why can't we reason with others? This is challenging to us because he never had to be merciful towards us, amen? The Lord didn't have to be that way with you and I. The Lord didn't have to be grace, gracious to you and I. But his love for you and I changed everything. The fact that he loves us, it changed everything. And Christ's love in you should also do the same. The love that Jesus has poured upon your life should change the way that you do everything that you do now. The way that you love your friends, the lost, your parents, your your family. The way that you extend mercy to people. The way that you extend grace towards others. It should flow from a life that's connected to him and only him. Because God has been gracious to us, amen. And we must hold that quality of the Lord dear to our heart and our life. Because the source of life, church, is applying the wisdom that our life giver gives us. Amen? See, listen, you could stand just like that man. You're, you remember the story of that man that was next to that pool, Bethesda, and he was there, and, you know, for 40 years, I believe it was, you know, people kept getting in the water before him. And healing was literally right there. It was, it was, it was just an arm's length away. And what's interesting is when Jesus walks up to the man, the man explains his situation. He tells him everything that he's been through, and kind of gives him a, a little summary of what he's been dealing with. And Jesus doesn't do anything, you know, what we would think was miraculous. I think, though, in the moment, because this man knew who he was talking to, 
the words that Jesus spoke prompted this guy to have faith. He said, take up your mat and walk. You see, there's a lot of people stuck in this life going absolutely nowhere. And maybe we're the ones that are putting more loads on their back, more burden on their life than they're able to carry. And the Lord's wanting us to speak over their life, to speak over them in such a way to where they would be able to turn from their sin, turn from that life that they've been living and step into faith in Jesus. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says this. Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And said, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one, freely given us in the one he loves. Verse seven says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with all of God's grace and riches that he's lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Amen.